Hey everyone, welcome to the Christ and Coffee podcast. I'm Pastor Jeremy. This is my good friend Haig, and today we have uh, our good sister on, Dr. Heather O'Hanison. She's here with us from uh, Oregon, and Heather is an associate professor of philosophy and religious studies at George Fox University. Uh, she holds a PhD from Columbia University, and Heather researched play for her doctoral work and used the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard as a major conversation partner in her thesis. Um, Kierkegaard is somebody who both Haig and I grew to appreciate in, in our exploration of Christian faith. And so we've been wanting to talk to Heather for a while and explore uh, how she intersected with Kierkegaard, how uh, she and he met, and uh, how she was uh, influenced by his work. So, but welcome to the podcast, Heather. It's good to have you on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, the first time, I think I met you the first time last October at a AMAA thing. Uh, I don't think I had ever really met you from before. Uh, that was like the first time we kind of crossed paths. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. How did you guys, how did you and Haig meet? Because I know Haig knew you uh, well before, before I met you, I think. I've been part of his church for a long time. So even before he came, I was in the New York church. There you go. Yeah. Cool. So Heather, what got you into Kierkegaard? I'm, I'm interested. Uh, how did you find your way into, into his work? Yeah. So when I was in college, um, I was a, a junior taking a lot of courses in philosophy and religion. And um, one book by Kierkegaard, Fear and Trembling, was assigned in three different classes in one semester. So I had a heavy dose. Um, and that is probably my favorite text of his. And it's, it's a really beautiful work. And so... Um, I think it was sort of a done deal after that, that I would continue reading him and engaging, engaging his ideas. And that ended up being the case even more than I could have anticipated when I was, you know, like 20 or however old, however old I was at that time. Could yeah. you elaborate more on Fear and Trembling? What's the context? Uh, what's the topic? How is it written? Because I think most people, when they hear Kierkegaard, this is usually the, the, the text he's most known for. For sure. Yeah. So Fear and Trembling is a pretty short book, but it's very intense. And Kierkegaard takes that phrase from the Bible. It's used in Philippians and other places. Um, I, I was even hearing a sermon of the, um, the woman with bleeding. When she touches Jesus, she touches him, I think, with fear and trembling. Hmm. Um, so the, the main point of that philosophical work is this investigation into the story of Abraham and the Akeda and the book of Genesis, which is the, the story of the binding of Isaac. So um, one of the things that's really special about Kierkegaard is that he has this very playful approach to writing where he adopts different um, authorial names or different pseudonyms. And so he writes from those perspectives. So it's actually not like him necessarily writing his own point of view in Fear and Trembling, but the, the author of Fear and Trembling is uh, said to be Johannes de Silencio. So Johannes de Silencio hears these sermons his whole life about Abraham and Abraham going to sacrifice Isaac. And he looks around him in church and everyone is just accepting this as if it's a completely normal thing. And he, he's just in awe that a person could have so much faith, but also that God could ask something so terrifying of somebody. And so it's an investigation into what it means to be a person of faith and how to really take, take that seriously. And, and the whole idea is that uh, God could require things of you that would cause you to fear and tremble. That's great. And any conclusions for that text? Like what, what's the, cause he, he writes it from different vantage points, right? Trying to understand why is God asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Uh, any sort of like conclusion on it or that's the beauty of Kierkegaard. Like he doesn't let you do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can talk a lot more about this, but um, basically from the perspective of that particular author, Johannes de Silencio, there's this admiration for faith, but not an identification as a faithful person. So Kierkegaard is able to represent this point of view where it's somebody who's very curious, like, what is this faith, but not somebody who claims to be very faithful. So I would say that the conclusion, I usually don't use that language of conclusion, but I would say that the conclusion of Fear and Trembling is that the highest goal in anybody's life would be to exist before God in the way that Abraham existed before God, where you, it's, you are completely alone with the absolute, you're beyond language, you're beyond culture, you're beyond normal ethics. And in that place, it's a, actually a very absurd place to be, but 
the absurdity is a source of strength. And so you can live a very faithful way by virtue of the absurd. Yeah, it's great. Um, I guess we need to provide some context for those who don't know Kierkegaard. Um, it's usually one of those names you hear maybe in uh, what's the good, the good place is an NBC show with that tackles uh, moral philosophy. Maybe that's like the oh, last yeah. time people may have heard him. He, he was highlighted uh, in one episode and there's usually the concept of the leap of faith that's associated with him. I don't know if he necessarily said it, but it's usually associated <laughs> with him. Uh, but let's provide some context to like who he was as a person, like where, what was his background when he was writing? What's the, what's the context there? If you could just, yeah. create some sort of background before we jump into some of his other works. So he's a 19th century philosopher. Uh, he is Danish. And so I think one of the reasons that he's maybe slightly marginalized is that most people don't study uh, Danish. So that um, his reception into Western philosophy really happened in the 20th century when he was translated into German and French. And then he became enormously uh, influential and even kind of, I would say, secretly influential, where a lot of the people who adopt his ideas, like Heidegger, they... They don't really credit him, but he was writing in the first half of the 19th century. So he lived from 1813 to 1855. Um, and uh, his context was one of Christendom. So um, Denmark was a Lutheran country in this de facto way where you were a Christian just by virtue of being a Dean. And that's really what was at the heart of his philosophy was um, how to make Christianity difficult again and how to make it an accomplishment. Yeah. And one of the ways that you would do that is you would make it really terrifying, right? So that if you show the costs of being a Christian, being the kind of person who could be asked to sacrifice your child, for example, then that would call into question the, the automatic nature of faith for people. Yeah, absolutely. And as, as all of us are Armenian, like I resonate with that because we were like the first Christian nation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're Armenian, you're a Christian. Even if you're an atheist, you're a Christian because it's so part of our culture. Uh, so I, I really resonated when he was like, a, like questioning, assaulting. He has a, a essay attack on Christendom yeah. uh, to yeah. wake people up to like, hey, wake up, people. Uh, this Christianity is not necessarily uh, enacted in our culture, even though we we have this cultural label of Christendom to us. Uh, so it's it's part. It's a huge thing in his whole moral outlook, uh, but it deeply resonates. Um, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I'm a huge fan of him. Yeah, he's well. kind of like he's kind of a troll. I mean, in a lot of ways, like big time, big yeah, time. Yeah, he, he would be very disruptive. Uh, he wrote a lot, from what I understand. I mean, like furiously. I, I think, and and there's like anecdotes about him doing strange things, like re, like writing furiously in the middle of the night by candlelight, and and again, like writing. Um, with uh, fake names as a pseudonym. Um, this is actually one of my all-time favorite stories. I tell it in all of my classes, but um, Kierkegaard had all of these games, not just in terms of writing under different names, but he really was almost, I don't know, in almost this insane sort of way, he would cultivate a public image of himself. Hmm. Um, so it was important for him to be seen in public and in very cultured spaces. So he would go to the theater and he would, um, I think he would go at the beginning of the evening and then he would sneak out and run home to, to write. And then he would go back at intermission and talk to everybody so that he could be seen as this dandy, this man about town. And then he hmm. would leave again and just go to write. Um, but uh, I was reading even in his journals recently and, and that was a very deliberate strategy on his part. He wanted to keep his interiority to himself and to have this um, image as a kind of man of the people, a man hmm. in the crowd. Um, to to keep his work hidden in some way interesting yeah and, and because, sorry just one other thing because like yeah. then people would think that he was this loafer that he was this idler like he he was just this man of arts and culture but they wouldn't see how hard he was working underneath all of that right right did that play into like uh how he was received i mean was he not really like well received until later i mean like a lot of his publications and things like that did that come after his death I think there was only one book that sold out in his lifetime, and he often would publish a work under his own name on the same day or around the same time that he would publish something synonymously. Hmm. And so towards the end of his life, there was this thing called the Coursera Affair, which was this public scandal. And um, after that, he really had a kind of terrible relationship with the people, or he, he felt very, very badly after that. He felt... Um, 
uh, I don't know, just made fun of in a really terrible way. And so, mm. um, and I think after that, he started to attack the press as much as he was attacking the church. So he, he thinks that the press is part of the problem of what he calls leveling, where everybody has this lowest common de denominator level of equality. Mm. Um, and he thought that under God, you could have equality in a very high sense, but that if you trusted uh, the crowd, everybody was going to be leveled down to this anonymous figure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think troll is a beautiful way to describe him. I can't imagine if he existed today, how he would use social media and what kind of memes he would create, what, what kind of uh, videos he would create uh, in the 21st century. But he also was uh, able to write because of his inheritance, right? Like he was also in a unique circumstance where he was given a certain amount of money from his dad. He just was able to just write and he wrote a crazy amount in a short period of time. And then he died of a, at a pretty young age, if I, if I remember correctly. And I was just reading last night, by the way, that he, um, he, I didn't know this, but he was running out of money towards the end of his life. So right. basically, he dies in 1850, uh, 1855. In 1848, because of the revolutions in Europe, there was this in Denmark. And so his money really lost m most of its value. Mm. And he, from that time on, like apportioned out the the money into units and by the time he died he had no money left so i don't know how that works exactly but um there are a few philosophers who were i guess fortunate enough not to have to teach or to to work in that sense and he was one of them but also like um charles purse is another one in the 20th century and they get a little weird like i think there's something about not being in the classroom context that mm. lets your uh mind go it's like being homeschooled yeah <laughs> Um, one of the things so you mentioned earlier, I hadn't really known why this took place, but um, you mentioned earlier that because uh, he wrote in Danish, he wasn't really translated and received in like Germany, France, other um, European centers where, you know, philosophy is taking off in huge ways at the time. So uh, uh, from what I understand, and, and it could be wrong, the, a lot of his work influenced German and French existentialism. Um, so Jean Paul Sartre, Heidegger, Foucault, um, and if I understand correctly, one of the concepts that he really um, honed in on that was helpful for existential thought was this theory of like angst and, uh, and just sort of existential sort of dread at the emptiness of life. So could you talk to that a little bit? Could you talk to the emptiness of life, Heather, and <laughs> share with us a little bit about how how he uses that? I mean, how he uses it because you know as a um, somebody who was contributing to some degree to Christian thinking, like how he uses that as a way of being um, a disciple of Jesus. Sure, absolutely. So he is known as the father of existentialism. I think that this is a little inaccurate. I mean, you can certainly go earlier. I might say Pascal was the father of existentialism. Um, mm -hmm. So by, I don't know, a couple of hundred years. Um, but he's the one who gets credit for it. And Existentialism can be understood as just a philosophy that is concerned with human existence. What does it mean to exist as a human subject? So um, what, what does it mean to be a subject, to have subjectivity? Um, for Kierkegaard, you're not automatically a subject. To be a subject is something that you achieve. It's, it's like being an individual um, where you're, and this is the dread rule, this will speak to the dread. You're making choices that have eternal consequence and you don't even know what the basis of those choices is and so that's the kind of thing that's going to give rise to incredible dread and anxiety um, he has a book called the concept of anxiety and part of his tactic in that book is to in a literary way make you feel anxious so the the prose is almost indecipherable it's very very hard to to make sense of and so as you're reading it you're feeling anxiety and so i think it was a deliberate um, move on his part and so this comes, yeah, comes to, to be one of the core concepts that's carried over into a very atheistic existentialism in, in France. Yeah, it's interesting how like a lot of these popular philosophers take so much from Kierkegaard, but they take that like just that introductory part of him fleshing out like sin and the consequences of sin. And then there's no good news. There's no hope. There's no love, which is like all the other wor works that Kierkegaard did. Uh, so I, I always find it interesting how 
how influential he was for so much modern philosophy, but how often he never gets credit. But it's also hard to give him credit because of the way he wrote and uh, and, and what and because he was also like unabashedly Christian, um, which is not popular uh, in the 20th century or 21st century in a lot of philosophy circles. Do you think that's the case today, or is it kind of a mixed bag? Uh, just in a, terms of people giving credit to him. Be, I think he gets credit now, but uh, like just being a Christian and a philosopher, do you feel like there's uh, any tension there? Or is it more like, all right, if you're a Christian and you're a philosopher, you just end up becoming a theologian? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I mean, I guess maybe those are, those are separate questions. So I think um, in Kierkegaard's studies, I would say most of the people, at least in my experience, who study him are Christian. But I remember years ago, I was at a conference where a woman t wanted to read him like kind of to bracket the Christianity. And I just, it was, it was so difficult for me to even understand that project. I think you'd be doing violence to the, the very essence of Kierkegaard's work. Like you, I, I didn't understand what she was trying to do or if it was even possible. Um, and I think, yeah, there are plenty of Christian philosophers today, but I do think that um, a lot of people who would do philosophy as Christians probably just end up going into theology because there is a kind of hostility in the, in the academy. Mm. All right. Uh can you speak on uh, the spheres of existence? Because I think this is so important. Uh, this has been something revolutionary for how I perceive and do ministry, just this concept of these three spheres of existence he has and kind of what, how he taught the work uh, of these different spheres, if you could touch upon that. Yeah, I mean, I, there are a few things that um, are really foundational to how I view either the world or when I engage other philosophy, I, I take Kierkegaard with me into those books or ideas. And I think the three spheres of existence, this is one of the key things I've, I've taken from Kierkegaard. So it's um, this uh, sort of developmental account of selfhood. Um, and I don't know, Jeremy, as you're doing work in psychology too, like pipe in here and see <laughs> if, it, if it holds mm -hmm. for today. But what yeah. Kierkegaard is saying is that um, the three spheres, or I, sometimes you could say stage, stages of existence are the aesthetic the ethical and the religious. Um, and the aesthetic has a very technical meaning. So this is not just like having to do with the senses. It's um, in his mind, um, when you are controlled by the senses and when you are controlled by every passing desire or whim, and it's often the, it's, it's when your identity is determined by those around you, especially this crowd. Um, and for him, most people are stuck in that way of life where they don't really have selves and they don't know that they don't have selves. Um, it's a very easy way of life, but there are no commitments. There's no saying no to the self. It's like being kind of stuck in adolescence or something. Yeah. Or like a frat boy, right? Or like he's just partying, just experiencing the pleasure principle, right? Like and, and in fact, actually, there's a really wonderful scene in Either Or where this estate is talking to a judge. And the estate, um, I think this would like... Uh, uh, apply to many, many people who can't decide what careers they want. So they're just stuck, you know, every profession is open to them, but they can't make a decision. And, and so this estate is saying, I could do this, I could do that, but he was unwilling to commit to one of those choices. Hmm. And so the judge says this to him, my whole purpose in working with you is just to get you to choose, like to choose choice. <laughs> <laughs> So then, anyway, that's the ethical, moving into the ethical sphere, which is when you say no to yourself and you apply universal laws. So let's say, you know, the thing that you want is to steal the candy bar, but you say no to that desire in order to appeal to what's Kant's categorical imperative, the thing that applies to absolutely everybody, do not steal. Um, and that's a really great place. Like if you can land in ethics, good for you. Like the world would be probably better than it is if more people lived in an ethical sphere of life. It's highly rational and logical. You use language to explain what you do and why. And then the last sphere, the highest sphere is the religious sphere, um, which is a sphere of, of faith. And at that point, you're actually beyond reason. You're beyond what is universally communicable. You're out there with Abraham in the abyss hovering before God and it's a very silent place. You have no language anymore to explain uh, why you sacrifice Isaac or to justify your decisions. It's a form of being alone before God that is, I think, very beautiful, but also very terrifying and um, po post-logical in some way. That's the leap. So the leap happens um, out of ethics and into to religion. 
So I'm curious just in, in hashing that out. So that the last sphere, I've always wondered this. And so now we have a Kierkegaard scholar and we can ask her about it, but at what, at what point in that third sphere in that religious sphere, um, does Kierkegaard reach in any point for a sense of community? So is there ever in that religious sphere? Cause that, that move seems like terribly individualistic. Like it's just going to be me and God in this post logic, you know, world. And at, uh, does does that ever get hashed out in his thought of what kind of responsibility we have to others in that sphere of the religious? This is a very popular question. It comes up a lot. And I think there is a new interest in, in unearthing a political Kierkegaard. So what kind of political community could exist? Um, I have a few things to say, but the first comment um, is just that I think if Kierkegaard were not writing in the context of Christendom, he would have had a different project, but he was so much pulling in the opposite direction of the capital C Lutheran church that he was focusing on the individual. Mm -hmm. So basically you can see the, um, there's a dialectical process here where you're moving uh, through negation to a synthesis. Um, The first stage is this kind of immature individualism me, 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 all of my desires. Then you move to the universal and the ethical phase. And then you uh, dialectically capture or recapture the individual in that third moment in this redemptive way. Um, There's a really beautiful passage in in Fear and Trembling where the Knight of Faith is described as being so like the people around him in this incognito way that he blends into society. And so that's really the passage I always go back to to say, In his account, the Knight of Faith, even though that person is a single individual who is probably eccentric, just like Kierkegaard is eccentric, Mm -hmm. that person really likes other people, is really happy with other people, has good conversations with other people. Everybody who meets the Knight of Faith in that scene in Fear and Trembling really likes him. And um, so I think that that's a way of making peace with community where you reintegrate into the world. For him, that's the whole point of the Isaac story is that Abraham was promised Isaac back in this life. And so that's the miracle of faith is that he didn't just renounce Isaac to heaven, he got Isaac back. And so I think anything that celebrates that kind of faith is going to be okay in, in having community. Yeah, that's really interesting. The way, the, way that, the way you're describing it matches really well. And like, like you said earlier, to speak to it from a psychological perspective, a concept in uh, a type of therapy conceptualized by a guy named Murray Bowen, called differentiation, how well you're differentiated as an individual. Um, You could be totally enmeshed with other people so that you're not even making your decisions. Other people are making them for you and you can't separate your feelings from the other persons in your realm. Uh, Then you go the drastic other way and say, I'm just going to be me at the cost of all others, or I'm just going to make the decisions that others have decided for me. And to really become differentiated, you have to learn how to be yourself in the context of others and be able to work out like being, it's a, it's a lifelong thing, but it seems like it really lends itself there to, to what Kierkegaard is talking about. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And after you get that like faith relationship with God established, I mean, like his last major, like one of his last major works is the works of love. And it's all about how to love other people. Like it's 400 plus pages on what does love look like? And it's, you, it's an action you do towards people. So it's like, if that is radically applied, it's going to lead to a community. And, and speaking of love, I mean, wasn't uh, a lot of his work, hashed out in the context of an intense love conflict with uh was he ever engaged was he fully engaged or yeah yeah, with regina um, yeah unrequited love so maybe i'll just say a few things and then i'll get to that point so um there is a turning point in his authorship after concluding a scientific postscript which is one of his really long works um Uh, he moves to writing under his own name only, and then those works are explicitly Christian, they're edifying, and that includes works of love. Um, I think of works of love a lot, especially like when people get married, I always think about this idea with the third term. So Kierkegaard thinks that absolutely everybody is your neighbor, like your spouse is your neighbor, um, in addition to like people you would normally think of as your neighbor. Um, And he thinks that God is the third term in every relationship and so when you love your, your neighbor as yourself, God is the mediating force in that. Um, mm. So I think like, I don't know, uh, 
when you have a difficult time with your spouse, like maybe you don't love that person qua spouse, but you love that person qua neighbor, and God will always be that third term to to keep that link in place. Hmm. That's a really beautiful concept. Yeah. I'm I'm curious if so if we have somebody listening in who has never heard of Kierkegaard and who is wondering, okay, what's like one little nugget that I can take away from Kierkegaard? What would you say that nugget is for them? Like what, what would you say is the thrust of what Kierkegaard is trying to get across to us and that makes him so valuable for us as people listening to him? Yeah, I can think about what I would distill it down to, but both of you work work with people all the time. So I think you would have a better sense of, of, or maybe even the way that you've already drawn on Kierkegaard in, in ministering to people. Yeah. Why don't you share yours and we'll come up with ours. You show yours first and we'll show ours. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I think just the thing that's on my mind immediately is this idea of choosing yourself. Um, There's a really beautiful passage. um, Oh, I think maybe it is in concluding on scientific postscript so funny how it left me it might be an either or but it doesn't matter where you choose the choice that chooses you Hmm. and i think there's this process of becoming a self that you can engage in with god where you are both actively responsible for the things that you're choosing but you're you're choosing the things that god has already preordained for you so to live authentically i mean kierkegaard is all about authentic existence which is a very he was millennial before it was cool yeah there you go (laughs) Um, so I think for, for me, the thing I would want to challenge people on is who are you and how have you become who you are? Is it just this thing that you are who you are because of American society or wherever you're living? Mm. Have, you, have you done the work of becoming who you are through dialogue with God over who God wants you to be? So that there's this way that God has chosen who you need to be, but you actually have to move into that space deliberately in this um in this way that no one it's like that is the individualistic moment it's you and god at that point it's very very intimate i don't know i remember one sermon where um the pastor said you know when you are wheeled into the surgery room and you think you're going to die like you are fundamentally alone at that moment it's you and god Hmm. and i think kierkegaard is giving a way of approaching all of life in that way like it just reduces everything down to to you and god yeah one of the things one of the things I take away from him just touching on authenticity is I appreciate the, the humor almost. And the, like the, like we said, I mean, in many ways he's a troll. So I appreciate how he um, just really teases the, is disingenuity a word (laughs) or the lack of, of ingenuity of of people or authenticity and, and what he saw was kind of a bougie middle-class way of being in the world that didn't really process or think through critically what what life was all about and so i just appreciate that sensibility about him that posture about him um i really like some of the little parables and sayings that he would have um uh i i never remember what i think it was ducks maybe it was geese but there's a famous duck or geese parable you know they it's i don't want to tell it here because it'll take too long but i i just love the fact that he could use these little like uh, accessible, uh, humorous kind of stories and parables to get people to sort of, uh, again, unmask their routine everyday lives um, and the way they were kind of hiding themselves and, you know, create that angst to get them to reflect. I think sort of striking people in order to get them to reflect is something that, that you won't miss if you, if you read Kierkegaard. Yeah, I'm reminded of a parable when he's talking about a circus, a clown at a circus warning the audience that there's a fire and they think it's part of the, the gag of the circus yeah. performance, but there's actually right. a fire and the, the, the ship is going to burn. Yeah. And I feel like that captures uh, not only how he probably felt when he's trying to wake people up to an authentic life with God, uh, but I think a lot of pastors could resonate with that. They're preaching every Sunday. <laughs> they talk about sin. They talk about eternal consequences. And it's just like a performance. And uh, so much of the state of the church right now is uh, like a performance. Right, right. Um, and, 
since you shared your parable, I get to share mine. So the, Go the, for it. it's, it's the one about the ducks waddling to duck church and the duck pastor gets up and he quacks all these sermons about how ducks have wings and ducks can fly. And then everybody quacks their amens and all the ducks just waddle back home. And it's, nobody flies. Nobody does anything with it. They just go and they quack their amens and walk away from, from the service. So I just, it's such a, again, it's hilarious, but it's also subversive. And it just like kind of gets you to reflect and think like, what am I doing here? What's the point? <laughs> like, what is this all about? Yeah. I, I love uh, Kierkegaard's like reading the gospels through the three spheres of existence, like seeing the mm -hmm. sinner and tax collector as being someone mm -hmm. part of the aesthetic sphere or the ethical sphere being the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and then kind of like Jesus slash where the disciples are trying to get to as part of the, 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 the religious sphere. So that, that really helped shape not only like reading scripture, but also what does it mean when I'm trying to minister to people? Where, where, where are they right now? Uh, so that's always been a huge practical thing. But I do love the fact that he uh, has this desire just to be pure before God. Like uh, one of his essays that really like wrecked me and, and is like really woke me up to uh, pursuing God is purity of the heart is to will, will one thing. Hmm just to be radically willing one thing, not to be double-minded. And it's just a reflection off of James, rid yourself of double-mindedness. Mm. And, and what does that look like to really say your will be done, your kingdom come? Um, and then finding yourself in that, what does that lead to? Um, and I think another important thing is he's a valuable tool for Christians to engage uh, the philosophers that came before him because he trolls like Hegel and Kant. He like, he makes fun of them and respects them, but also pokes holes at them. So like he's a valuable tool to engage uh, the philosophers who came before him, but he's also uh, someone where it's like, hey, you know, like this modern philosopher took this from him. <laughs> yeah. Totally, and for Socrates too. Socrates was the most important philosopher yes. for him. And um, within the religious sphere, he sees Socrates as this intermediate figure between ethics and what he calls religiousness B or Christian faith. So Socrates is as far towards faith as you could get before Christ. And um, all of that kind of gadfly legacy. So Socrates was put to death for corrupting the youth and for just going around in the marketplace and asking people why, 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 why. So that's the legacy I think that he takes from Socrates. And he sees himself or frames himself as that annoying figure who's nettling uh, Copenhagen in, in his, his own time, his present age. So I'm... Um, in your doctoral thesis, you were exploring play using Kierkegaard's sort of conversation pieces and takes. So what does uh, Kierkegaard contribute to, to play? Like, how did you develop that? Yep. So my own story was I went into graduate school wanting to study work, the philosophy of labor. And I, I had that in mind as a research topic for several years. And then I was in a graduate seminar with my advisor on Hegel and Derrida, so two really important philosophers, continental philosophers. Um, Hegel precedes Kierkegaard by a few decades, but um, and then Derrida is a 20th century, late 20th century French philosopher. And in that class, we read an essay by Derrida that's on play, and I couldn't figure out where to put play in my framework. So I had a binary of work and rest, uh, and I thought, well, is play work or is it rest? Mm -hmm. And I think because of my training, I was taught to expect that that third thing is always the more interesting thing. So play split the binary, and so play is this third category, and that, that became my, my research focus. So I ended up writing on on the philosophy of play, on the concept of play, particularly in relation to freedom and constraint. But you can imagine that play just by its very nature is a very slippery concept. And so I was really struggling, how should I structure my investigation into play? And here I had all of these, this love for Kierkegaard. And so I decided to apply the structure that we just talked about, the aesthetic, ethical, and religious uh, framework. And so now I, in my dissertation, I examined play under those Kierkegaardian concepts. Mm. And it was a, a very appropriate way in my own point of view to, to talk about Kierkegaard because it was indirect. So he is the master of indirect communication. So I, uh, without talking about him explicitly until the very end, uh, I used his categories as a way of engaging this other topic. But obviously, as we've already talked, he's extraordinarily playful himself and it's just a lot of fun to read. So. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I do like how the podcast is like a throwback to some of these pl- platonic dialogues because uh, it's like it's a form of indirect communication, right? You're you're having people with different opinions communicating with another one another, and then there's the reader or the listener now who's trying to get truth from this conversation with the, these different characters because it's like a form of indirect communication. And the Kierkegaard just took that to another level because he was so inspired by Plato. Um, which is interesting what, what kind of indirect communications are taking place right now on social media uh, and how are we kind of being examples of that with this podcast or other ways, whether it's a clever meme or, or, or it's just a, a comment or uh, uh, to, to get people to just stop, think and process to discover the truth from, by themselves. Yeah, and just to clarify, so like a direct communication for Kierkegaard would be, this is what faith is, is to have that very conclusive kind of statement where he's teaching you and he mm-hmm. refuses to do that. And so instead he chooses indirect communication where he is eliciting feelings of faith or feelings of terror um, and really causing causing you to make decisions for yourself um, through, through these kinds of staged um, dialogues and things. So. Mm-hmm. It's it's fun to see how cyclical communication is because there is this throwback um, to to dialectic philosophy through podcasts, and then um, there's one Jewish magazine called Tablet, which is a throwback to the the tablets of the the commandments. (laughs) There you go. Heather, any final comments you want to share with the listeners? If 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 they are interested to read Kierkegaard, where where should they start? Any good resources or any final thoughts you would like to share before we wrap up? Sure, absolutely. So Fear and Trembling is a difficult book, but it's small and absolutely worthwhile um, starting and engaging. So I would point people to Fear and Trembling. But then also um, you could pick up one of the um, books, either Works of Love, which is towards the end of Kierkegaard's um, writing, or he has these series of upbuilding discourses, which are his sermons, and those would be very encouraging for Christians. And so um, it would be like reading a very thoughtful sermon with these duck uh, parables and things included. All right, great. Uh, Thank you for joining us, Heather. It's great uh, to have you uh, on this podcast to talk about Kierkegaard, someone who's influenced all three of us uh, and uh, so glad to have this conversation. Thank you for all who are listening. Remember to stay caffeinated and uh, be well this week. God bless you and take care. Oh.